Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with Dorota Godby. And we're going to be having a conversation today that's especially useful for those of us who consider ourselves sensitives. And uh, I'll have Dorota explain more uh, uh, how, how she perceives that. And for all of us, you know, we all know people in our lives who um, have a more sensitive constitution and how can we help ourselves or help them uh, be more successful in both um, life and work. Um, Dorota, it's really good to have you here. Oh, I'm really glad to have this conversation. Yes, it, yes. It's a new conversation to be having in the world and much needed. So I'm yeah. curious what we'll get up to. Absolutely. Well, let me go and share your background with everyone first, and then we'll get into the conversation. So I'm just going to read out your, your bio here. Dorota Godby works with sensitive individuals and professionals who have an additional challenge when, uh, when dealing with problems is how to adjust the best practices that are taught out there for their sensitive system. Dorota has spent 20 years investigating uh, multiple modalities uh, and she has created a unique blend of gentleness and depth that sensitive people can thrive on. She's an empathic, multidimensional and practical ally who can help you to integrate your inner wisdom with external guidance. And I, I've especially appreciated um, Dorota's um, engagement, her, her discussion, communication in the various um, courses that she's been in uh, with me and just on social media. I just always really value her, uh, her comments. So Dorota, um, let's start with uh, talking about what it means to be a sensitive person? How do we know if they have a more sensitive constitution? Language is quite funny. So when people hear the word sensitive, there's a number of ways that you can hear this. Um, the way I use the word is pretty much um, what it says in the dictionary in terms of, you know, a sensitive system, sensitive person, sensitive, sensitive organism response to stimulation to the environment to what's going on to the quality of uh, conversation or the situation that much more intensely that much more readily um, and of course uh, since the 90s we have now the research uh, by dr um, aaron that demonstrates that 20 percent of people have sensitive constitution as a natural healthy trait nat natural healthy type of constitution in the way that some people have got petite bodies and some people are big boned or have blue eyes or green eyes and so on. Yeah, no, I, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, why wouldn't, of course, there's a diversity of human beings in all mm. sorts of traits. And of course there's so-called average and then there are uh, more sensitive and less sensitive, you know? So that makes a lot of sense. Um, I do uh, find that I work well with a lot of <laughs> sensitives. I mean, there are a lot of um, and maybe, maybe that's something you can speak to a little bit is I, I do tend to draw, uh, quite a number of sensitives into my audience. Why do you think that is? Ah, uh, you, you see, I'm not surprised at all. So if, if the kind of statistical average is 20% in human population, I imagine your statistics are my heart much higher. And it's probably because of the values you carry, you know, for authenticity, for serving, for, um, being um, uh, interested in the quality of life in virtue, but also because this is my personal um, appreciation of your of incredible kindness and gentleness with which you offer those things. And gentleness is a quality that makes, I suppose, any heart sing, but sensitive system requires that to function well and to thrive. So that is that combination of gentleness and depth that I love in your work. And, and I imagine that that's what draws sensitives to you. There are some environments, for example, non communication, which is one of my communities is like that as well, because of the inherent deep values for compassion, for humanity, that that community tends to have higher percentages of sensitives than, than you, you know, average kind of randomly organized groups as well. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's, that makes a lot of sense. And so, um, you know, sensitives uh, uh, may feel more vulnerable also when they're asking for support, right? Um, and yet all of us need support. Uh, talk to us about that. Um, 
Oh yeah. my, this is, this is, this is particularly tricky. You now, uh, Dominic Barter, who is one of the NVC uh, uh, novel communication trainers that, that I respect, says that, you know, when we have a challenge or a problem, it's never a question whether we can or cannot do something, but it's a question of having sufficient support. And so I think this is true, deeply true for, for human beings and for how we resolve problems and we are social beings as well. But imagine having a sensitive organism, you know, a little bit like the hedgehogs who are my kind of companions and ambassadors of sensitivity that I use, that things you, you, that you are so um, affected by what happens, you know, for the stimulation, even by sensory processing, you know, bright lights, louder sounds, that sometimes reaching out for support can be extra vulnerable because what if the support does is not gentle? What if it's not extra conscious and kind of deep, uh, which is how I make uh, sense of the world. It, it sometimes leaves us with a, the, a very painful choice to either be on our own when having a problem and struggling and being scared and not seeing the way forward or reaching out for support. And then maybe the, the format in which support arrives becomes a new problem on top of already scary problem and it quickly becomes overwhelming. So it's, it's such a tricky combination. And yet, because I am really biased here, but I, I have a sense that um, that sensitive organism is one that processes everything that much more deeply, is so, so therefore notices things more deeply, learns more deeply. And so when you find allies and supporters that work for you, and you have a system that is an excellent system to navigate this world with, then sensitives really blossom. And then it looks like, um, you know, a very surprising quantum leap where you where where at first you were really drowning and maybe really worrying about yourself. And yet with just a little bit of that gentle deep support, things, you know, realign quickly. And then your own intelligence, the, the system and the, the care that you carry, sees you through really really well yeah wow it's beautiful um and so how uh, how can sensitives um i guess find find the right kinds of support maybe do you have any any tips for that um yeah or yeah. what's what's helpful what's been helpful to you it's very interesting because um Oftentimes people come to me not thinking about the sensitive conversation, but because someone, I had an a, a acupuncture student who was overwhelmed with the coursework and, and it was her mom who sent her to me because her mom could sense that I suppose that combination of, of, of gentleness and depth that, that her daughter also carries naturally and also in me, and she must have seen me in a workshop somewhere. And then, of course, immediately that, that rela relating to one's own system and to sensitivity becomes quickly um, a big part of the conversation. So, so sometimes it's a question of being drawn to someone and feeling safe with them. And, and so that's where you really need to check people out to get a sense of them. You know, like I sometimes, when I when I go to brand new, let's say a, a lecture or presentation by, by a, an expert I don't know yet, I sit really close to them and it's almost, I want to sniff the energy. And in particular, there is a kind of sense of running it by my body, by my own, uh, you know, the things that I have learned to trust that the body knows much better than perhaps that, that any sense of seduction or persuasion by the you know, mesmerizing side of expertise. So yeah, but generally you will find that sensitive people are very particular and very picky about who to choose because typically they, um, you know, when I just chose the word multidimensional for my bio, this was because of colleague who, who recognizes in me and said, you know, this is exactly my, uh, another sensitive colleague that I need the person to be dimensional. If they have a black and white, simplistic worldview, I know they are not going to be a good match for me because I naturally need to look at things deeply and, 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 and deeply means not just white perspective, but also perspective that includes all sorts of layers of life or aspects of life that we naturally are interested in and have to have involved in the, 
in the in the way we solve the problem or in the way we do things. Otherwise, we're just not connected, not engaged in that. Mm, that makes sense. And speaking of kind of solving issues, um, how do sensitives adapt or need to adapt the solutions that they hear from experts, you know, teachers, coaches, etc., to to a more sensitive to their own system? Yeah. So it's it's a blessing if they know that they have a sensitive system because often people uh, don't relate to that aspect of themselves consciously. You know, the world doesn't exactly celebrate it at large. So sometimes people are kind of the way that there are there are closet introverts for the same reason. Sometimes people you know are in the closet about the sensitivity. So if they know, then they already have some criteria to look out for. And they will look out for people who are at least aware of human sensitivity as a trait. Um, and if they um, don't know, then actually, because you asked about about so is uh, about customizing for sensitivity, so. They, they already would know because you cannot know. It's like the way you cannot be sensitive, have sensitive teeth and not know about it. You know that oftentimes things look attractive and you want to do them in this way. But when you, when you try, it doesn't work for you. And often people have that. So, so, they, so they know that something, something, is, something happens there with best practices, with advice, with expertise that it doesn't quite add up. And of course, very often they, they have a sort of self-doubting um, narrative about it. Maybe there is something wrong with me because you know how, how come I can't make this thing work even though it looks good, other people make it work. How come it doesn't work for me? But people who have, you know, in fact, aging helps here because the longer you live, the longer um, uh, stretch of data you've got about stuff that works for you and the stuff that didn't and, and why. And so you begin to figure out that actually, even with the best findings, you still have to customize them for, not only for how your system works in a, in a way it's sensitive, but also what brings you to life. And there, so, so typically I, I, tell, I say to people that actually really listen for the principle of what people are teaching and then take the how that they recommend as an example, but customize it to make it your own. And that, that typically gives much more effectiveness uh, as well as durability in terms of strategies, you know, new strategies to uh, take yeah, on board. That makes, that makes a lot of sense, thank you. And I'm curious if you have any kind of examples you wanna share about how, how you know, either you or somebody you know uh, sense the person who's you know, kind of adjusting best practices to to one's own uh, situation. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, in the world of self-employed people in, you know, who need, we need to have some kind of sense of where we're going or making priorities. Uh, and, you know, typically annual planning is something that people recommend. And I have found that there is no way I can do annual planning. I, I fail at annual planning. And of course, it took a while to figure out why. And when I came across the 12 week planning, it became much more doable and still needed to put a spin on it in terms of um, not so much picking goals for three months, but picking projects, and then focusing not on um, patrolling the projects and you know making things happen but kind of allowing things to have to, to emerge a little bit organically and then reviewing each three months deeply and learning from the review and course correcting and creating new choices going forward based on what happened in the three months and this is quite amazing that where i used to fail at annual planning and the goals were, were har hardly met and I felt like a failure. With three month planning this way, where the emphasis is on emergence, reviewing and course correcting, I always, when I review, I'm surprised that I've done more than I set out to do. 
and this is the same for colleagues and for clients who, who are taking it this on. So this is one example. I mean, another one, your own very teaching about diligent um, daily um, chipping at it, you know, that, that is a particular, um, particularly um, successful way that you have and you teach. I have a single mom, I had a single mom who was, uh, um, you know, with, with son needing to become substitute teacher because of lockdown. And she had three essays to run, to write for her. Um, it was for her counseling a professional course. And, you know, she, there was no way that she could do it your way. And even though I had the conversation about the discipline and about kind of, you know, doing that doing things daily is actually um, it perhaps more easily, easily to achieve than getting around to it every now and then. But still in her case, we needed to, it was not doable. And so we started in a very unexpected place of repurposing how she was using her rooms so that her son could have a messy room. She would have an uninterrupted calm room that created the environment where she could write. And then we talked about the childcare and how she could you know, buy herself some time that she was alone with the writing and in the calm room. And, and so then it came together, but it actually it wasn't um, in a kind of linear everyday um, dedicated way, but it was when the childcare was available. And, you know, so you really need to look at each person's situation as an individual. And to be honest, the society gives us blueprints, teaches us, you know, courses and uh, technologies and methodologies. But I have a sense that, to be honest, everyone is an individual and has unique ways of thriving and solving problems. We just don't have enough interest in that conversation, or at least uh, our systems are becoming more agile. Now, there's a whole agile um, approach to working now that emerges through software developers that is that much more customizable and shorter term and based on reviews that are more frequent. So I think it's coming um, and, and the sensitives are leading that conversation because we cannot um, keep in step with the normal, the old normal ways anyway. So we have to customize, innovate, and then show others that it's actually more fun as well as more effective. Yeah, that's a great example. And I, I love that you're emphasizing that it's, you know, every individual has I mean, I think a genius, right, to how to solve uh, their own problem um, that uh, an expert can't necessarily give them. I really see um, advice and courses and trainings as sort of like, hey, here's something to experiment with. This worked for me. Maybe it'll work for you. Who knows? Uh, maybe it'll work for a few other people, but, you know, you need to experiment with it and then you're going to change it, right, to, to make it work. So, so uh, let's kind of complete this conversation um, with, you know, you said something about, I love the, you know, adapting the annual plan to the 12 week plan and like not uh, like doing things to make sure we don't, we, we feel progress uh, and we feel um, pride in our uh, progress rather than um, blaming ourselves for not living up to particular mm. standards that other people think uh, should, should be ours. So how does, yeah, t tell us about this kind of like, um, how does, how, how can sensitives feel more successful or feel more um, like they, uh, yeah, just, you know, proud of themselves and, and their own, uh, uh, you know, abilities that it takes time, I guess. Yeah. It takes time. Um... I have noticed a very interesting pattern, both in myself and in clients, which I um, have um, now kind of a short uh, phrase that I describe it, that we are late bloomers. Uh, kind of in, in, in the, or it can, we can look like late bloomers. And that's because the kind of normal unfoldment or um, how we go about things is that we experience prolonged incubation and then a quantum leap. And so if you add anxiety or misunderstanding of sensitivity at that starting phase of that trajectory, then, then, then that, that um, quantum leap sometimes is interrupted and doesn't happen in, in the same way. But when you know 
and you will need allies to to encourage you and and to to help you trust your own rhythms so that you don't give up and you you don't mess up with a longer incubation yourself but when you do it is just amazing how you know looking back how worthwhile the whole trajectory was and actually deeply satisfying because then you the quantum leap you know takes you perhaps even further than you would otherwise if you were going at this in a linear way and especially if you were going at it in an inauthentic way so so that's kind of how the pattern i see and of course um then with clients i get them to you know try it out experiment and and prove it to themselves you know how that works or indeed whatever other quirky individual rhythm that works for them at the end of the day it has to be individual yeah that makes a lot of sense and so this is where you know coaching is so helpful working with mm. an individual at a time i know that's one of the services you provide actually i'd love for you to tell uh share with the audience you've got you know one-on-one -on -one services you've got a group program you've got an online course uh, or multiple actually so um however wherever whichever direction you want to start uh share with the audience how you how you work with people so one-to-one -one, i work with quests where we take on one aspect of of uh, effectiveness or sensitivity and we upgrade the kind of how people do this and the habits and the kind of the approach to that's it. Great. You so call it a so quest. I call yeah. it a quest because of that individual way means that we don't know what we'll discover, but but we yes. know what the quest is about, right? Mm -hmm. um, but a, a particular way that I love supporting that individual discovery or tweaking of systems is through journaling. Okay. Because journaling is, you know, um, if you are sensitive and affected by people's response and moods deeply then again there is a kind of vulnerability that you've got to go with trusted allies or all things can go not so well whereas paper my god paper is so much more unconditionally present than people and so i teach a, a kind of um, format that i call unity journaling because you can use journaling to both organize your thinking and you know think into a new problem as well as to listen to your heart and to express your heart and, and process your emotions. And, and to have fun also because the element of, um, you know, kind of more artistic or individual expression or colorful expression comes into it as well. So people are having a lot of fun leaning, uh, learning to get met every single day through journaling in this particular way. And so these, I run these courses uh, periodically and we have support group to kind of encourage one another because it's, it's funny, it's like in this um, anecdote about, uh, I don't know where I heard it, that, you know, about seeking God and how th th there was this person who was looking for God everywhere. And they, they, you know, and they just, they would get some tips and they would discover, no, that's not where God lived and that's not here. And one day they got a completely reliable tip and they knew where God lived. And they, and they you know, rushed there, stood at the door took one look and ran like hell. Because actually standing at the door of the possibility of meeting ourselves every single day, of being held, of being welcomed, of being appreciated every single day, is kind of suddenly, with all, all we want, and suddenly it's so hard to give it to, to ourselves. So, so it takes a little bit of um, encouragement and companionship from others to actually lean into the possibility of that of being met every single day so that's one of the um support formats that i really really enjoy because yeah, it's so, so doable it's called unity journaling i love that name and um and it, you you have this online course and you have sort of a group uh support group around that as well mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you also of course you know you can work with people one to one, but tell us more. Tell us what what else? How else do you support uh, your clients? Um, so, it, it, thanks to actually your role modeling and courses, I am experimenting with new topics to have the sensitive conversation in, and so short three week courses, mm, one one course at a time, because the conversation about sex sensitive thriving is still relatively new in the world and what and especially uh, one of the topics I'm sitting on is how to 
allow ourselves to think a little bit longer into the options we are looking at rather than be seduced by more is better or by a particular recommendation and lose again that opportunity to inquire what works and, and um, what is um, sensitivity friendly for me. But this requires going against the grain of what society teaches, you know, look busy. If you are not busy enough, you will not succeed. So, so it's, it's very hard to allow this, but through the staycation experiment that I conducted, and in fact, the staycation, how to create your own staycation, it's another course that I recently released because very important for our times, I guess, uh, for a holiday. But it was thanks to the staycation experiments where I, you know, I couldn't work because it was a holiday. I couldn't go away because pandemic. This was what, for the first time I allowed myself prolonged times for, self, you know, what other people judge as navel gazing right like because there's there's only that much we can allow ourselves that and then it becomes selfish or whatever and actually my i'm amazed at after two months of part-time um staycations i was still working uh, a little bit every day but took extra long time after two months of that my effectiveness and joy and attractiveness to clients skyrocketed which i'm really amazed but you see it was so scary to allow this because of the conditioning being so strong to kind of move into productivity that much sooner than, than I think sensitive organism thrives on. And so if you take that a little bit longer to choose, you will choose better and you will have more effectiveness. But again, it looks different and very much non-linear compared to a lot of other people who kind of can move themselves through choices and decision-making in a more you know, rhythmical, regular way. That's very interesting. It's um, it's like you you have to gather the strength, um, you know, so that you can really be wholly uh, authentic and um, in your well gentle power, which is your you know the name of your website. Um, Dorota, it's been a pleasure to talk with you about this. I hope everyone is um, feeling more uh, understanding of themselves and of, of other people and of what's possible to thrive as a sensitive person. So um, your website again is, uh, well, let me go ahead. It's gentlepower.co.uk. Um, I will of course uh, put the link and you have uh, two Facebook pages. I'll put the links in the notes of the video. So be sure to check out the, uh, the, the links to Dorota's website and pages. Um, anything else you wanna share as we complete this conversation? It pays to be who you are, it pays to be authentic. And I guess you and I are colleagues in that conversation. And it's, it, I have a sense that this is um, a big part of the new normal that we're all wondering about now. So I'm, I'm just really, really grateful for this, you know, illuminating it together a little bit and for having companionship in looking at that world a little bit more deeply and more gently that, than what we inherited um, before. Yeah, yeah, me too. Thank you so much for your work, Dorota, and um, those who are watching or listening, I hope you'll reach out to her for um, to learn about the upcoming courses and uh, the coaching that she does. All right. Thank you okay, so much. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks, Dorota. Thanks. <laughs> Bye for now.